Good morning, and thanks again for being with us. Um, you know, we've got a lot of nonprofits here, more per capita than in any other city in Mexico. We've got 109 nonprofits for a little town of 180,000 people. It's a lot. And they enhance community on a daily basis with your help, and we're grateful for that. Today, we're going to talk about one that does a lot of early childhood development. Now, I'm not a mom, I've been a stepmom, I've been a wicked step monster, I've worked with children. But boy, I didn't know anything about the development of children until recently. And you're going to learn a lot about that today, and it's fascinating. You may remember Casa de los Angeles. About 20 years ago, Donna Quathmer, who's one of our uh, former uh, Citizens of the Year, one of the early ones, founded this. And uh, before I go on, I want to say that we've got another Citizen of the Year in the audience with us, and her name is Patti Palacios. Would you please take a stand, Patti? Patty is the leader of the organization we're going to talk about today, CELA. Um, anyway, Donna made it her mission to go out into the streets of San Miguel and ask single moms who had their kids like playing under tables at the Mercado, what do you need most? And almost universally, the answer was child care. And so she set about developing Casa de los Angeles, and it was quite, quite successful. In fact, um, over uh, the years, she had a hundred different children, a hundred children at any one time in her beautiful building. Um, next slide, please. That's the beautiful building, and that's in the Santa Julia neighborhood. Um, Rotary actually paid for all the furniture in that building, so if you'll show us the next slide, please. Now, that's not a very pretty slide, because, because all that is stored right now because during the pandemic they had to close. And so all those children, all those single moms lost the opportunity to participate. But that is rotary furniture. You can see it's beautiful and it's sturdy. And we'd like to take it out of, out of, uh, out of the storage. So I'd like to uh, talk to you about the fact that maybe you remember Donna retired about five years ago. And she left, and she took her amazing fundraising talent with her. Nobody could quite fill those shoes. So over time, um, there was a merger between Casa de los Angeles and Centro Infantil San Pablo. And then they had two buildings. And what do you do with two buildings when you're not doing enough fundraising for one? So they leased one. It took them a while, and they finally leased that building, and that's wonderful. And they all moved into this one building that you just saw a moment ago. So all the daycare kids and all the, all the little infants moved in. But again, two years of pandemic, nothing going on, not a lot of money coming in, not a lot of kids being served, and a lot of moms, desperate, single moms, desperate for how do I make a living and take care of my child. So um, the next, yeah, they're very good. He's ahead of me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, so. What has happened since is that they've reopened the daycare part, the part for the little infants and children, because the, uh, the uh, moms came to them and they said, we're so desperate, we'll help you. We'll pay something for this free childcare. Please open up. So they've got eight children now, out of that former census of 100, eight children who are being served at this point. They've got five more classrooms available, five more classrooms filled with rotary furniture that are not being used right now. And of course, that's where my dear friend Kay Miller comes in and her friend Clarissa Montanaro. Kay moved here to work with Casa Los Angeles. That's dedication. And she's worked with them for over and over and over during the years and now is working with Patti at SILA. And uh, Clarissa is a research scientist who knows a lot about early childhood education. So I'm going to turn this over to Kay to share what she knows, and then she'll cue up Clarissa. I'm going to stay here because I didn't get enough protein this morning. I'm afraid I'd fall over if I stand up. Um, yes, Robin's right. I moved here 14 years ago initially to volunteer at Casa de Los Angeles. But I've got to tell you, I fell in love with that place, and I've been in love with it ever since. 
Um, Diego, if you could put up a couple of slides. I think there are three of the children. And I don't know how anybody could not fall in love with these children. And then I fall, fell in love with the program that Donna developed. It just kind of happened organically. She'd hear a need and she'd fill it. And one of them was the empowerment of some of the moms. These moms came to Casa de Los Angeles without self-confidence, without self-esteem. They were used to living in poverty and being on their own. Many of them abandoned by the fathers, abandoned and abused by the fathers of their children, and oftentimes abandoned by their own families. Um, so they became a part of this community. And what I observed is that over time, these women learned how to support each other. They took care of each other's children on the weekends when the other moms needed to work. And it became um, swept into this were the siblings, the latchkey kids. They were on the streets after school until their moms were out of work. And they were welcomed to Casa de Los Angeles with after school programs. The teachers developed for them art programs. We had some young men who went out and played basketball with them. And the next piece of it was the meal program. The meal program, with, with the help of Feed the Hungry, fed these kids, not just the daycare kids. That Costa de Los Angeles is the mentor and heroine, Donna, who had the vision to over the world, Scandinavia, Japan, all over Asia, uh, the U.S. and Canada, and the real thing. Oh, have we not? Did we see the children go of the volunteer house? So other NGOs have volunteers. I don't think maybe this many because Donna built a volunteer house that could house 14 young people with a living room shared. That was literally right across, nope, not that one. Um, the playground's in the front. Yeah, um, so she built a volunteer house right across the playground from the daycare center. And these volunteers, many of them are her gap students and between a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, came and some of them volunteered for a year, many for six months. And they made a huge difference because obviously they were a supplement to the teachers. Can you imagine one teacher to eight eight infants, um, and so they did that. Many of them get, came with ideas of their own and did training and taught Spanish to the moms and um, really enhanced the program. Um, so, and paid for the privilege, right. They paid $50 a month to live in this beautiful facility. So as, um, Donna mentioned, as uh, Robin mentioned, the program grew from 30 people. And what some of you will remember was the old barbecue restaurant at the end of Villa Seca and um, into this beautiful facility up in Santa Julia, which kills me to have five classrooms empty. And that's kind of what we're here to do today, is talk to you about how can we develop a program that will spark people's enthusiasm to want to help these kids. And so now I'd like to turn it over to my friend Clarissa, who I always knew that this was a great program, but I didn't know how important it was in the brain development of children. 
So I'd like to turn it over to Car Clarissa Montanero. Thank you, Kay. Um, I want to be sure before I start that we get the slides advanced to the right spot. So Diego, can you just keep going here for a bit? Just to be sure that we're in the right. Oh, OK, now back up. <laughs> OK, now there was, there's a brain scan slide. That's the next one after this. Do you have that in order? OK, great. OK, now let's now go back to the Centro Infantil. You just got a preview of what's coming up here. So let's go back one. Diego, can you go back one slide? OK. Great. All right. So So the way that we're envisioning this program is drafting off of the previous work, the previous incarnation of this program. This is we're seeing it as a dual mission program. The children, their mothers. So when we're thinking about the children, what we're thinking is, is that, of course, these are children from birth to age three. And by the way, Centro Infantil de Los Angeles serves children also from three to five. That program was able to stay open during the pandemic. That is still going. It was the, the, the program for the younger children that had to be shuttered during the pandemic and that we're trying to restart and reimagine in, in an even stronger way. So serving those children, now these children are at risk developmentally and our goal for them is to boost their development. As for the mothers, as Kay so beautifully described, these are impoverished women. They are single mothers of young children. Impoverishment, single parent, young children, they are the most stressed adult population in San Miguel. And our goal for them is to empower them economically and psychosocially. Now, before I launch into some more of the detail here, I, there's one dynamic I want to highlight for you, and I call it the mother-child welfare dynamic. And here's the way it works. When a mother does better, her child does better. When a child does better, the mother does better. This is a dynamic, interactive, mutually dependent process. And because we are targeting both populations, what we anticipate is that we're going to see some accelerated outcomes in terms of benefit to both the mothers and the children. We're particularly excited about that. Um, we do think we're going to see some exceptional results. So now let's talk about the children. What is the opportunity that we have with them? These children are all facing clear and immediate developmental threats. Now, there's a whole multiplicity of these threats. I only have time to talk about a couple. I'm going to talk about two. The first one is difficult to talk about. And that is that impoverished women, women living at or below the poverty line, are much more likely to give birth to a child who has physical stunting. Part of this is due to prenatal care, those kinds of issues that everyone else knows about. However, a prime driver of this is that impoverishment causes massive stresses in the body. It's a whole interesting science about that. One aspect of those biological stresses is that there are stress hormones. We all have them. They're all coursing in our bodies. Low levels are actually pretty functional. But we're talking about catastrophically elevated levels of stress hormones. Those hormones cross the placenta. They are neurotoxic to the developing fetus. And that's why these children, even though they're born at full gestational age, 40 weeks, that is why they are smaller. And here's the even harder thing to acknowledge. This stunting includes the brain. These children are born with less brain volume than their typical peers. Now, there's a second developmental threat that I also want to touch on, and that is these children face a stimulation deficit. As Kay described, impoverished women who have no place to put their children that's safe and appropriate, if they can, they will take that child to work. So you can imagine going to the Mercado, you see the women sitting at their tables. If they have a baby with them, 
bringing their child to work, that baby gets slid under the table. A tablecloth goes over. That child is getting none of the necessary stimulation that it, that, that child needs on an ongoing, immediate basis all through the day with their mother. That is a second and very serious developmental threat. And I, by the way, I want to say that is not an act of neglect. That is a woman who is forced to make an impossible choice. If she looks down at her baby, passers-by, she will not have eye contact with them. She will not be able to sell or offer it is whatever she has to offer. She won't be able to do it. She will not make the $5.50 she has to make that day to feed herself and her kids. So now let's, Diego, let's go to that next slide. So now I want to show you what this looks like when a child has proper stimulation and when they don't. The image on the left is a scan of a child who's two years old who's had appropriate developmental stimulation. The slide on the right is a child who's the same age, two years old, who has had inadequate stimulation. Now this is, a, you know, this is a kind of a more extreme case, but it perfectly illustrates what I'm talking about here. That you will notice that the brain on the right seems to have black voids compared to the one on the left. Those voids are a lack of neural connections in the brain. They haven't happened. And you will also note that where there are neural connections, the brain is under firing. Those neural connections themselves, even though there's a network, it's not strong enough, it's not adequately built out. Now there is, if there is no assistance given to a very young child who has that kind of brain status that we're looking at right here, there are lifelong outcomes all the way into adulthood. So, Diego, next slide, please. Oh, okay, there's another one that says uh, life outcomes. Can you toggle to that? All right. Now, this is not foreordained. This does not happen to every single at-risk child. But the chance that there will be negative life outcomes is three times greater for a child who has been inadequately, when they're very young, having inadequate developmental support. So these are all very known, very well documented outcomes. I call this Pandora's box. This is the basket of ills. This is what happens if we do nothing. Now, my conviction is that here in San Miguel, there's a sum total problem if this starts to happen in, in a family, and that is the sum total is that generational poverty is deepened. All right, so now let's go to, let's go back to a brain scan slide. So what can be done? Obviously, I'm sure you all get by now, what I'm talking about is let's, we can get in there and stimulate that brain. That brain on the right, that, that one that is showing inadequate neural development, you can get in there and you can have a program where you are deliberately stimulating the child and because of, and there is a, a biological phenomenon which allows this to happen. In very early life, the brain is poised to be very neuroplastic and neuroplasticity is the brain's response to new experience. It is the brain building new neurons, new networks, in response to what the person is encountering. So let's go to, all right, now we're gonna to go to the slide with the graphs and the lines. So here we see, all right, so now, if you look from zero, the years scale at the bottom, zero up to five, that is Sela's world. You can think of Sela as you know, a really comprehensive early intervention program. Our task today, what we're thinking about, is rebuild that very early piece. So what I want you to notice, so this is all, one way to look at this is that this is the chart of, the neuro, of neural network growth. And 
I hope you can see, especially in the back, that each of these lines represents a whole region of neural networking. Now, what, what is really interesting, of course, is that if you look at zero to three, look how everything peaks in that very early period. That means that there is explosive neural network growth for language, for something called emotional regulation. This is, you know, emotional regulation is something happens to me, I can stay calm. The neural networking for that peaks at age two. So we have emotional control. We have something called habitual ways of responding. So someone who's fearful, you know, if they're fearful by age two, then that habitual pattern has been developed, that neural network has been developed, that kind of gets baked in. And then you notice right around, um, peaking around age three and then declining, depending on what type of network we're talking about, declines to age five. Now, the brain is meant to do this. There is this developmental window where the brain says, it's time to build the superhighways. If you think of the brain as a transit system, this period is, we gotta build the freeways. From age five through puberty, it's more like, okay, it's time to build the secondary roads. From puberty to actually age 27, which is when the brain is fully mature, it's, okay, now we build the malls, the residential neighborhoods, the airports, everything else that's needed for, the, for there to be a brain that is, metaphorically, an entire transit system that's efficient. But if these super freeways do not get built at this early stage, what happens subsequently is sparse. It is not an efficient transit system. So going back to birth to five, one of the metaphors, we talk about thinking about it like a freeway. So from birth to five, it's like the brain is saying, okay, we're building these freeways. We need the trucks, we got the asphalt, we've got the engineers in the white hats, we've got the people in the orange vests, we've got the backhoes. It's a very, very active time. That is what is going on in the brain of a, of a child who's receiving appropriate stimulation. But a child who is not receiving that appropriate stimulation, it's the equivalent of a handful of people showing up with shovels and a bag of cement. It's wildly inadequate. So what early intervention proposes is that when you know that that's happening, you metaphorically, you call in the Army Corps of Engineers, you reset the stage, you get all of those resources going in there, and you change the fundamental growth trajectory of that brain. So, Diego, let's go to that movie clip now. So what does this really look like in real life? What is, what is early intervention? What is it exactly? What are you doing with the kids? This is going to be a clip of a newborn. This child is 10 minutes old. And, I'm going to, and this child is interacting with its father. The father is going to make some facial gestures, and I want you to watch how the child reacts. Can you... Matt, there we go. Okay, so here's the dad. Gestures, oral motor gestures. Watch the baby. Ten minutes old. Real time. And Dad's gonna make a second gesture, and this to me is funny. Watch the baby. Oh, I think I'm sticking out, sticking out my tongue. Oh no, I should have it open instead. <laughs> All right, I got it. And the father makes a very cooing, warm remark. So I wanted to show you that by way of showing you that humans, including ones who are developmentally delayed, have an inborn capacity to learn very quickly. And what you saw here, imitation, is the foundation of all human learning. When we are doing early intervention, what we are really offering children are warm, available adults in the proximity that you saw doing things that make sense to very young children, things that will stimulate a response. And by the way, when you were looking at that clip, 
I can tell you that as the child was imitating its father, neurons were being built at that very moment. So what I, one of the things that I think is just magical about early intervention is it does not require exotic materials, esoteric programming, expensive, um, expensive objects. It just requires available adults ready to interact in that warm, engaged way with kids. That's, what, that's, that's all it takes. So now going to, there is a slide, Diego, that shows two lines, one orange, one blue, crossing each other. All right. This slide come, came out of the Harvard Child Study Center. This is, okay, at the bottom we have age. So this chart goes from age two to age 70. The blue line is neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to respond to the changes that happen. Notice at the earliest period how incredibly hyper-responsive the brain is. Notice also the orange line, how much effort it takes to stimulate that. Pretty low effort. As the developmental window closes for neuroplasticity, as the child gets older, you can see Neuroplasticity is declining through childhood. And then there is the fateful moment where the lines cross. Where, and that point is at full brain maturity, that's age 27, where the amount of effort that has to be exerted to build a, a new neural network is far greater than the payoff in terms of what the brain, how the brain can actually respond. So the takeaway there is that I would never say that any efforts exerted on behalf of older children, adults, are a bad idea. I would never say that. But what I am saying is that when those efforts are applied at the earliest stage of life, the payoff is not like at any other time during the lifespan. It is easier, it is less costly to kind of quote unquote fix a brain, form those strong brain circuits during the early years than it is to try to fix it later. So let's go to the next slide. I think it's just a central infantile slide. All right. So now I've talked about the children, I want to touch on the mothers. Again, Kay did a beautiful job of describing what happened in version one of this program, which is spontaneously, organically, among the, the mothers, they formed this vibrant, very strong social network. And the reason that that would happen is they're, they're meeting every day at a place that they like and trust, they see their children are thriving, and they themselves, these mothers and women, are welcomed and treated with, with deep, deep respect. That creates a matrix. And what that matrix is, and what you end up with is, you end up with an effective women's empowerment cohort. As we come back and revive this program, our intention this time is that we know that going in. And what we want to do is we want to build on it be really conscious that that, that that potential is there. And what we, so there are two things right off the bat we know we're going to do. First is there's going to be a program of parent education. There are easy things that a mother who's working full time, who has many other stresses, there are a handful of really easy things to do if she knows that, to do them. Her parenting is gonna be easier, the children are gonna be better, they're not that hard, we can teach that. The other thing that we can introduce Thank you. The other thing that we can introduce is um, a, 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 a economic empowerment program. There are other NGOs that work like that um, in San Miguel. We want to partner with them. And that takes me to the final piece of all this. How are we going to pull all this off? What are we thinking? And that is that we know we want to go the distance. We want to build something that endures, that is sustainable. We want a situation, we want a program where we're going from strength to strength. We are envisioning three pillars to support 
these women and these children. The first is the volunteers. Kay has done a great job explaining how that works. There's already a volunteer house. Sela is now interviewing for a volunteer coordinator. There was a volunteer pipeline that went dormant during the pandemic. We're going to revive that. And of course, what the other benefit that volunteers bring is that their energy. You know, they are ready to roll up their sleeves. They are a way of keeping things really vital on a day-to-day -day basis. And the other thing, there's a long-term benefit with volunteers too, especially when you're thinking internationally, is that when those volunteers have a good experience, they become evangelists. That is, there's a long-term play there for building the kind of international support that we hope that this program engenders. Pillar number two, and this one's kind of, we might not be expecting, data collection. I hope that this program is compelling, morally, ethically, but these days, I don't think that's enough. There needs to be proof that it works. And what that means to me is that you collect hard data and you demonstrate outcomes. I have a background in doing it. I personally don't think it's that difficult. Um, and what we expect with that is that we are going to be publishing these outcomes. And when I talk about outcomes, I'm talking about child outcomes, child development outcomes, and maternal welfare outcomes. Okay, institutional partnerships. More hands make lighter work. We want to get into the harness with other NGOs and with universities. Universities are resource powerhouses, research, funding, talent. We expect at the outset to be generating those kinds of partnerships. Our motto is, as I said, let's get in that harness together. And I think it's time for me to leave it right there. Thank you all so very, very much. I'm all about impact, and this is an impactful idea, um, and it's an impactful program. We don't have time for questions right now, but these two ladies will be right outside in the cafe to answer your questions. And you know this is going to take resources along the way. And whenever I say resources, somebody says, what does it cost? And I want to tell you what a bargain it is. For $3.28 a day, you can take care of these children, which take, takes care of our future. So I want to thank you very much and turn it back over to Lee. Thank you, Robin. Thank you all very much. This was an incredibly interesting and great presentation. Please take this as a token of our, our appreciation. And we are also uh, giving you an In Polio Now certificate. We're going to donate 10 polio, polio immunizations in your, in your honor for, for coming to speak to us. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our, all the past presidents, we're going to meet in the back, of the back of the room immediately after I ring this bell, and we're adjourned. <laughs>